My name is Jonathan DeVore. I'm uh, currently a postdoctoral associate in, here at the uh, program in Agrarian Studies. And uh, I'm here to introduce our third panel for the afternoon, uh, the title for which is Pigs in the City. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about uh, two campaigns to take care of or take, get rid of um, corrupt food in 1850s Manhattan. Um, and there, one was the 1858 swill milk crisis. You see some of those images on the left side. And then the 1859 piggery war that came right after. And um, they differed markedly. And I, I, by comparing the two, I think we can get at how pigs were treated differently from other animals in the city and why that was the case. So both the swill milk dairies and the piggeries took advantage of a lot of um, waste in the city, not unlike what we were hearing in Cairo. Um, and they, they took care of this excessive food waste and turned it into new food products. Um, in the case of swill milk, they were um, converting, these cows were converting distillery swill and turning it into milk and meat. And swill was a combination of processed corn, barley, um, and rye malt that was left over from distilling liquors and, and beer. Um, and by feeding the slops to, to cows, the distilleries were turning the remnants of what was seen as a corrupted um, or a corruptible beverage into something that was the purest of foods, milk. You could feed it to babies. Um, yet this purity was exactly what was most troubling. So this is a map that was, was produced um, showing where the distilleries were. Um, and th though the swill milk um, crisis came to a head in 1858, New York had been struggling with the quality of its cow's milk for decades. By the 1830s, uh, several distillery owners in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Williamsburg, and the Bronx had, were, were um, taking advantage of this idea that they could, they could um, have cows on their property and, and pipe in the swill over to some, some stables. Um, dairy for production for large cities like New York was complicated in the 19th century. This is before refrigeration, before you know refrigerated railroad cars. So you had to have milk close enough to the city that you can get it in without it spoiling. But it has to also had to be the cows had to be far enough away from the city that the farmer could afford pasture, um, that there wasn't enough real estate pressure to be pushing it away. And this was difficult. You'd have milk spoiling on on route to the city. Um, so. So the, this, was, this seemed like a perfect solution. You could have the cows in the city, and they'd be taking care of waste that would otherwise be dumped in the rivers. So um, here, here's, you know, here's this wasteful material. Feed it to the cows. You get milk. It's close in. It, it's going to be fed to New Yorkers, and there's no issue with spoilage. But it wasn't so simple. Um, cows. This was hardly a, a nutritious, swill was hardly nutritious for the cows themselves. Um, when introduced to the boiling liquid, cows typically balked and wouldn't want to eat it. So it would take a couple of days until you know, desperation would drive them to the slop. Um, a diet consisting exclusively of swill uh, led the, made the cows sick. They would get sores all over their bodies. Um, and their condition, their living conditions, um, as described in the 1850s, were similar to the exposés that you see at factory farms today. They lived in cramped stalls. They never went outside. They um, didn't have very much ventilation. Um, the milk that the cows produced was this blue, bluish tint. Uh, it didn't look very good. So what the vendors did was they, they adulterated it. They added plaster of Paris. They added flour and eggs to make it look white and thick. Um, and so this was hardly an attractive, let alone nutritious beverage. And it was difficult, this was, this was before labeling laws, so it was difficult for New Yorkers to know what they were getting. They'd buy their milk on the corner from, from carts or in, groggery, uh, in groceries on the corners. And um, the vendors' carts would say that it was Orange County milk or Westchester milk or pure country milk, but it was actually coming from 16th Street or, or 39th Street. Um, and poor regulation and enforcement kept the business of dirty milk profitable and viable. While doctors and journalists had long been calling for reform, um, city politicians ignored the newspaper's pleas uh, until 1858 when Frank Leslie published his, um, published his newspaper and an expose. Um, Fr Fr Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, and you've been seeing images from it here, um, was barely three years old, but it would come to really truly make its mark on, with the swill milk expose. 
Um, unlike the previous exposés uh, in the New York Times, the New York Herald, and the New York Tribune, Leslie's, Leslie's articles were filled with woodcut images and that ignited the public and pressured previously reluctant politicians to take on this issue. The visuals really made a difference, and um, the Irish, the, the owners and the, um, the dairy hands who were typically Irish immigrants, the owners weren't. The owners were wealthy, native-born New Yorkers, but the, the, um, the milkmaids, as they were called, even though they were all men, but that was a gender thing that was thrown at them, the milkmaids were um, all Irish immigrants, and they knew the power of these images immediately, and they attacked Leslie's artists, and that was, that's what you see going on in this image here. Um, yeah, here you go. So you see the, the Irish are over here, and they, they look, you know, kind of a scraggly, swinish sort of um, look to them, apish. And here's the, the, uh, the artist on the right side who's come to, to, um, to, to, to you know, to, for this expose to, to paint, to draw what, was, what he was seeing. And he gets attacked with brick bats and, and stones and rocks and, and logs are being thrown at him. And you can, and, you know, there's, there's um, uh, even one man who was interested in these articles went to go to one of the Brooklyn distilleries and he was mistaken for an artist, and he was dealt, quote, a blow between the, the peepers um, be, for, being, for presumably being one of his artists. So this was simply not good for business, for the milk industry. Um, Frank Leslie presented the images to the public that not only opened their eyes um, to the sickly appearance of the cows and the, the horrid conditions, but also emphasized the otherness of the people who were in control of their food. Um, you know, and you can see the social class and, and identity um, that, that's being, an ethnicity that's being shown in all these images. The, 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 the artist seems refined, the, the Irish seem um, bedraggled at, at best. Essentially, brutish, untrustworthy, and violent outsiders had control over their food, and something had to be done. So when Leslie's expose um, inspired a government investigation, one might have assumed that Swill Milk's uh, life was, was limited. Um, the public was enraged, bad press was inescapable, and the pressure to close down businesses was coming from left and right, from all these different constituents. Um, but this, this actually didn't come to fruition that well. Uh, so, so a committee of five aldermen and, and councilmen, along with journalists, uh, toured the cow sheds to, at, at 16th Street and 39th Street. And the, the um, distillery stables had advance notice that they were going to show up, so they cleaned everything up. And um, they, the, the politicians took sips of milk and watched a, a cow being slaughtered and judged all of this. And um, they then wrote a report, and the majority came out in favor of swill milk, saying, actually, it's OK. It tastes like regular milk. Um, a couple of the, the politicians declined to, to sip the milk because they were a little scared. Um, and, uh, and that, with that, it was saved. Um, and Frank Leslie was livid. Um, he published an illustration that you see here alluding to the corruption behind the swill milk and the corruption of the three aldermen who came out in favor of it. Um, in this image, the, as the aldermen are whitewashing the stable, you see, um, you see the, the distillery owner putting bags of money into their pockets. And there's, there's, it says $5,000 over here. And there's another one hanging out of that guy's pocket. Um, and so it showed that the, these, these politicians were, were united most, maybe not in politics or um, in social class, but in mostly in their willingness to profit at the, at the expense of public good. So despite this expose, um, the distilleries continued to operate for several more decades past, um, past this expose. But, but the, Leslie's work, however, um, effectively directed the public's attention to the, the political entanglements of, of food regulation in the city. And, and changed the way that New Yorkers viewed food that was um, created within the city limits. Which takes us to the next year, which is the Piggery War. So with all the attention um, given to the, the conversion of waste into food, it seemed almost inevitable that, or a matter of time, until reformers' eyes would, would turn towards the offal boiling piggeries uptown. Establishments for fattening pigs, boiling and grinding bones, melting fat, skinning and rendering dead animals existed all over the city, um, especially in the uptown rural wards. Um, scattered amidst the, uh, the clusters of wooden shanties seen uh, in the northern parts of the city. Today, what's a uh, midtown? This is, this is close to where, if you know New York, this is close to where Carnegie Hall is today. Um, and these, these, they were scattered amidst these shanties, and these large-scale piggeries and boiling establishments recycled materials um, that many considered waste. Re recycle re restaurant scraps, carcasses, offal, bones, and blood. 
and um, by refining them for other industries and feeding what was left over to the hogs. So they, they would give bones to toothbrush manufacturers and button makers and fertilizer um, uh, companies. And, and, and um, with the food waste that was so plentiful in the city, New York was horribly um, unsanitary. The, 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 there was piles of trash everywhere. Um, this was a way the, for trash to be turned into protein and for um, it to be recycled into other manufactured um, materials. So complaints about the uptown piggeries mounted as the city's footprint started pushing further and further north. Um, wealthy downtown neighbors referred to this area as hog town, pig town, or stink town. Um, and their disdain for nuisances extended to the Irish proprietors who owned them. A writer for the New York Times described the neighborhood as a group of, quote, shanties in which the pigs and the patricks lie down miscellaneously uh, while their little ones of, of Celtic and um, Swinish origin combine, and with billy goats here and there intersperse. Um, yeah, um, the, the, I, the increasing tie between the proprietor's ethnicities and, and the piggeries cemented the threat that both this population and their hogs pose for consumers and the inappropriateness of their place in the city, the pigs and the Irish. When politicians debated the future of Hogtown, real estate values came up again and again. One politician made an argument in, in support of gentrification happening, um, that was happening around Hogtown, claiming that the area was improving rapidly, quote, and the people here wish to make it a pleasant residence for those doing business downtown. As the uptown neighborhoods around the developing Central Park were, were rising in value, the piggeries were not only becoming more visible, but they're also becoming more of a liability. Concerted efforts to, to remove the piggeries began in 1859 when a new, a new city inspector was, um, was appointed by the mayor. And he began his term by pressing the health commissioners to pass a new law um, banning piggeries, bone boiling, and offal um, boiling uh, south of 86th Street. As soon as the, the commissioners of health uh, approved the resolution, the, the so-called piggery war began. The troops are made up of um, sanitary and health inspectors, as well as members of the newly formed uh, Metropolitan Police Forces. This is the moment where the police are, are professionalizing. And um, they visited each of the piggeries and gave all the piggery owners three days notice to get rid of all their materials, the, the cauldrons, the hogs, the pens. Um, and, if, um, and then they would return three days later and do it themselves if any of that remained and, and drive the pigs to the, to the pound. The piggery owners had to act quickly to, to sell their, their um, or relocate their animals. While residents did what they could to hide the remaining hogs, um, sometimes concealing them among beds and linens, um, the police were persistent and successful. And the newspapers reveled in stories of Irish biddies hiding, hiding uh, pigs in their, in their dresser drawers. Um, uh, it, this is a moment where domesticity is being embraced by the middle class, and the idea that, that these people would bring pigs so close to their beds and to, into their homes just was, it just showed how, how very far from normal the Irish were. Um, when the, while the piggery owners often threatened the police, the little, little violence actually occurred. Um, women actually played the most violent role here. Uh, in one case, my kind of favorite story from the Piggery Wars, this, uh, the one case this pol police man seized a hog by its, its ears, and then he was confronted by this, quote, large, squarely built German woman with a large tin pot. Um, and she whacked the officer with the pot in a way that made him see stars. Um, despite the police's power, or maybe perhaps because of it, the newspapers reveled in moments where they lost control, as you see here in this image. Um, there's, you know, they highlighted scenes where the hogs ran between the police officers', officers legs, toppling them over, or where, um, where the police desperately tried to hold onto a pigtail and have it slip away, or where police were just so um, taken aback by the smell that they, they were holding all these fabrics in front of their mouths just to, to kind of make it through the piggeries. Um, regardless of this chaos, this was still more, much more control than the city had ever exhibited over the, over the pigs or over the environment in the city up until this point. The news, newspapers portrayed the piggery war as, as a war for the protection of the city's health and prosperity. Journalists described the immigrant proprietors as outsiders, threatening the city's health and challenging its civility. How could you have a city be at once a nation's metropolis, but still have no control over its public health, its land use, its, its food supply, or even the practices of its residents? In almost every article, authors painted the Piggery War in triumphant, triumphant terms. They equated the police and health inspectors with war heroes, um, while describing the Piggery owners as ridiculous, backwards, 
stubborn and defiant. There was a lot of humor in, in, injected into these articles, and it was all basically poking fun at the piggery owners. Um, unlike with most of the, the swill milk crisis, um, where corrupt politicians ultimately stood in the way of active change, reformers found true success in the, in the dramatic closing of the piggeries. And it must have shocked New Yorkers to see their government actually acting efficiently here. By, by September, the, the piggery war was mainly over. The city inspector proudly reported that he had removed 9,000 hogs, whether by force or threat, demolished 3,000 pens, and confiscated 100 boilers. As one newspaper put it, the city had done a fearful amount of laudable depredation. So the, the recycling of and repurposing of food, food waste, it was an enormous industry in mid-19th century New York City. And because of its vitality and prosperity, as, as well as its assumed threat to the city's public health, the, the waste industries were politically contentious. The newspaper exposés highlighted the difficulties and dangers of urban food production. Um, while, while also striking fear among the middle and upper classes that, about the immigrant outsiders who were entrusted with their, this, their health and the, the quality of their food. So the, the big question here is why was the government effectively eliminating the, the piggeries while, while preserving the, the distillery stables? Swill milk was notably a bigger threat, um, you know, given the widespread use of cheap, poor quality milk by all New Yorkers whether it was wise or not. There was high levels of infant mortality at this time, and it was being blamed on, on swill milk. Um, this happened to coincide with the moment where breastfeeding was going out of style. So a lot of infants were, were consuming swill milk, and they were dying. Um, babies didn't rely on good quality pork um, they, or bacon for survival. They, it just wasn't as much of a threat. And um, yet the swill milk stayed. And the reasons for this include real estate pressure, ethnic stereotypes, and political corruption. So the, the complaints against the swill milk stables and the piggeries were subtly different. While anger over swill milk was, was more about unregulated, adulterated food threatening um, to sicken unknowing consumers and sicken children, the most, most complaints against the piggeries focused less on poor tasting pork, although that came up once or twice, um, but more on the inappropriate use of land so close to Central Park. The piggeries and the shanty towns that surrounded them be, had become a visible sore on the image of the city. For instance, reflecting back on the piggery war, and its success, a writer for the New York Herald um, wrote that it was, quote, hardly possible to conceive that so much abomination could have existed in a city such as this, as what was found in the neighborhood of the beautiful Central Park. It is hardly credible, and, it's re and, and the recital of it is positively sickening. The city was in the process of transforming and gentrifying in a major way, and the movement of wealthy citizens and residents closer um, uptown meant that, that piggeries and their proprietors were being elbowed out of the way. The smells, the public health threats, the unsightliness, the fact that um, the proprietors were less than respectable in the eyes of bourgeois New Yorkers had left the, the piggeries vulnerable to attack. The swill milk stables, however, didn't have the same physical presence. They were scattered in less desirable areas, and you needed a map to know where they were. You had to publish a map because people just didn't know. You, you'd pass the piggeries on, on um, stagecoaches uptown. You would not see it um, if you, you would not see the stables because they were hidden behind walls. But real estate and market, market pressures can't explain everything. Ethnic stereotyping also, and political corruption also played major roles here. Now, I'll admit there were um, you know, generalizations about Irish in both cases, but the owners of the distillery stables were these wealthy, native-born New Yorkers who had enough money to, to really sway the, the politicians. So um, Frank Leslie, fuming about the persistence of, of the swill milk stables a year after the expose, wrote that despite the swill milk being more dangerous, quote, the poor owners of the piggeries are, are thus punished while the wealthy owners of the swill stables escape with impunity. Perhaps if they had more wealth and political in, um, influence, like the distillery owners, the piggeries would have remained longer. Um, ultimately, this is a story not only about poor food regulation, but also about environmental injustices and the unequal um, policing of, of certain nuisances over others. Zooming out, this is a period in New York, um, New York's history, where New, it, the city is beginning to embrace an early form of zoning. Um, industries and land uses are, that were seen as incompatible with residential neighborhoods are getting pushed further and further from the edges of the city. The so-called rural wards, where the piggeries were located, were transforming. And the, the pigs were a smelly, visible presence of standing in the way of gentrification and transformation. Uh, New York was starting a new chapter in this area, and, which would involve redefining the neighborhood and what land uses were appropriate in the metropolis. Through selective targeting of certain nuisances, though you can see how the inequalities were inherent 
in this process to, draw, to segregate the uses of the city. So the modernization of a city can seem like a, a, set, a series of positive improvements addressing serious public health threats, transportation problems, increasing city's livability and efficiency, yet the process of taking control of the city was incomplete, messy, and notably uneven. And um, it was tangled up in corrupt politics, and it affected people and urban animals in dramatically different degrees, reinforcing social inequities. And in this, in, in this moment, in the mid-19th century, this is where you're seeing kind of a definition of what it meant to be urban, and what, where if pigs or other animals are allowed in that urban definition or not. This, these are where the, the boundaries are being, being drawn. Thank you. So we have uh, five minutes. Uh, questions for Catherine, then we can open it up to a broader discussion. Hi. Uh, that was really interesting. I, I work on antebellum agricultural reform, so that was super interesting. And I was wondering um, where you, s if this fits in or where it fits into these discussions that are going on around the same time about how to get city wastes back to farms to deal with like the soil depletion problem. So there's a, you know, there's a lot of people who are talking about this in the 1850s, and not, not just in the U.S., but uh, uh, in France and right Paris, right. So uh, you know that th that these systems need to be put in place to get all the waste out of the city and back to uh, these farms. And so, at first glance, it seems like this like swill milk is a kind of like that's exactly what they're trying to do. Um, so I'm just curious where it fits yes. into that. Theory. Yeah. So it's all about who has who's making the money in that situation because the um, this is, this all comes out of my my book Taming Manhattan. I actually have a chapter that's all about the waste recycling, also human waste and animal waste because it's being processed. There's the Poudrette factories that are outside of New York and and, um, and New Jersey that are are processing human waste and powdering it and making it kind of benign enough that they can then sell it as like a guano substitute to local fa local farms. But yeah, so this is kind of, it, there's waste happening here and you, you want to have that recycling, but they don't want this, they don't want it so close to the city. And there's another attempt to get rid of this offal that was being fed to the pigs um, that was, that the, basically the city wanted, or one, one um, city inspector wanted to take it on as a um, uh, that for private, a private contractor to get it in the hands of someone wealthy enough to, to position it far from the city and ship it down over there, and and then, then they could make money off it. And he had, uh, there was a very corrupt deal where he was actually making all the money. But um, yeah, so it was about the control. He wanted it out of the 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 Irish's hand, the Irish and German hands, and instead put into the into a contract where one person could benefit or one company could benefit exclusively. So it's yeah, it's not entirely in the same system of the manure that's being circled um, out to the, the, or the to, like, to, to Long Island and Westchester and Connecticut, but it's um, kind of a, a separate uh, recycling. But yeah, it's all kind of, yeah, it's, there's, there's some, it's not, it's not a very comprehensive plan that they have, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say it um, demonstrates the, uh, urbanization as a process of zoning, but, and, and then it seems, it strikes me that in direct relationship to that, it's also about urban places as sites of property. And, and I'm curious, I mean, you can see how swill milk survives by patronage and, and, and contract. And what I'm curious about is how the, the, the folks that own the piggeries got access to them. How did they, what was, how did they, how did they control the piggeries? Were, were, yeah. they, were they immigrant communities in fact and coming in, you know, was it a, was it a, a routine kind of, uh, um, uh, you know, hosting industry that would that would bring in guest workers and things like no. that. No, okay. no, these are small scale proprietors. Um, they were typically they were typically Irish or German immigrants who came in, but the, it, it was scattered amidst a bunch of shanty towns, and so um, people would take it up either informally. They weren't large scale. Some of them were large scale, and people owned like a lot of processing materials, but it was mostly small scale. You just had a pen and a cauldron, and that was basically the, the gist of it. And sometimes they were they were actually literally squatters, where they're on the up, uptown Manhattan was pretty rocky, and you had to blast. You had to get to a point where you the you could afford to pay the city to lay the streets, and and then also if there wasn't real estate pressure, you wouldn't blast down the the block to meet the street level. So they were up high on the on the schist and um, and kind of in marginal land, essentially. So some people were squatters. Some people had informal leases with the landowners. Um, and they were just kind of in a, in a sort of hodgepodge situation. Yeah. We, have a, we can do one more question for Kath, and then we'll open it up to a more general discussion. Yeah, hey, that's a totally great paper. And um, I uh, 
want to know if you had more to say about the relationship of this to transitions in market culture. Because at the same time these food crises are going on, there's a reorganization of New York's kind of retail market systems that you know Thomas DeVoe talks about in The Market Assistant and the book's kind of about how New Yorkers were getting their food. Is there a connection on that side of it as well, I guess on the retail consumer side as well as this environmental side? Yeah, so you see the, the growth of, um, whereas you're, you're seeing the growth of butchers, small butcher shops that are out in the outskirts of the city, and um, it's, I don't think it's, a impa- it's not impacted by the piggery war, or I'm sure it wasn't impacted by the piggery war, but the, the general devolution. At one point, New York City had these big markets, these public markets, and all the butchers had to have stalls in these public markets. And um, this, in the middle of the 19th century, you start to see that sort of withering away where these become more wholesale markets. And the, the butchers are either first illegally and then um, with, with uh, approval opening up small butcher shops throughout the rest of the city. And that's where you're getting a lot of the cheap meat. So a lot of this pork is being processed in those small scale butchers. And in fact, in that, that map, let me see if I can pull it up without making, you see a, a small butcher shop down in the, the lower left hand corner. And this was, this was part of the expose because they were saying all the, the horrible you know, swill me- meat is gonna be processed in that butcher shop and look how um, this is you know, the, the smoking gun that that was happening. So you're, you're getting bad meat on the market too. But again, there's no good labeling. So you kind of know if a butcher is serving cheap meat, then it's probably coming from these sources, from the, the, bad, the kind of poorly kept cows or from the, the pigs that are fed on the garbage. Good job.